Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris Linus from the NASA EOS DIS project, actually Earth Science Data and Information Services uh, Systems project, uh, which basically builds and manages the Earth Observing System Data and Information System, which we call EOS DIS. So I'm not going to use the long term anymore uh, because it's rather uh, a mouthful. And what I'm going to talk about is uh, the evolution, both before this current big data era and particularly where we see ourselves going. So the first half of the talk, I'll just give you some context on what EOS DIS does and some of the challenges it's faced over the past to give you an idea of uh, where we see this uh, big data problem going, particularly for the observational data from NASA in the future. Uh, so I mentioned EOS DIS uh, manages the data. That means we process, we archive, and perhaps most importantly, we distribute the data from Earth observing satellites. This is not really to scale, but it gives you an idea of how many satellites uh, are up there providing Earth observations. It's a fairly significant number. Uh, and we also do some data brokering with uh, our international partners, as well as take in some uh, model output data, actually assimilation uh, analysis data. Uh, and it wouldn't be complete if I didn't show you an example of at least some of the data. This is uh, carbon monoxide from one of the uh, sensors on the Aqua satellite called the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder. And I actually like to show this one because it's got a couple of unusual capabilities. One is because it's infrared, uh, it can see a lot of interesting features at night. And here we're seeing the total, car uh, total column uh, carbon monoxide. And this is from the uh, time when the Russian wildfires were uh, really causing a significant carbon monoxide plume over Russia. You can see this. So it was, it was quite a significant plume, and you can actually see it drifting, and in fact, if you watch this over time, you can see it going across the entire continent. Um, so back to uh, how EOS just plays the role in here. This shows the basic data flow that uh, we get from the satellites. So the, the spacecraft usually transmit their data to uh, another satellite that's uh, in geosynchronous orbit, the tracking and data relay satellite. Uh, there's a few that will actually downlink directly to polar ground stations. Um, and those are processed um, usually at Goddard Space Flight Center, where I come from. Uh, to level zero processing. And that really is just removing a lot of duplicates. Uh, it's ordering the packets in, in time order and it's putting them in nice, usually two hour chunks of data, which make it easy to process. Um, we've got a mission network that supports a lot of this. Um, and where most of the EOS uh, effort goes into is the science data processing and the data management um, in this blue box on the side. Uh, there we've got two main components. The science investigator-led processing systems are what are responsible for taking that raw data down from the satellite and essentially do, uh, retrieving geophysical quantities like that total carbon monoxide that I showed you earlier. Uh, they ship that data to the distributed active archive centers. It's kind of a double oxymoron. You've got distributed centers and active archives. So remember that the most important part of that, uh, of that is the distributed part and the active part. Uh, NASA is not really a long-term preservation agency. We're a research agency, and so we steward the data until its eventual disposition into a long-term long archive. So we're really more about the distribution of the data out to the user community, uh, which is on the far right. And this gives you an idea of the different types of communities we deal with. Uh, obviously, got a lot, a, a lot of research users. They're kind of our prime community. Uh, but NASA, th this uh, Earth Observing System data is also used by a lot of education users. Actually, another one of our big users is uh, the Earth System models uh, uh, and some of the decision support systems. Now, I mentioned they were distributed active archive centers. Uh, and this gives you an idea of how distributed they are. There's 12 of them currently. Uh, basically distributed pretty well uh, across the United States, although there's a significant concentration at Goddard Space Flight Center where we have four of those, uh, four of those systems. And the way that they have been um, allocated is more or less by discipline. And so you'll find up in Alaska, the Alaska Satellite Facility deals mostly with synthetic aperture radar products. 
uh, a lot of which have to do with sea ice um, and other polar processes. Uh, on the other hand, down in California, we've got the Physical Oceanography DAC, which is primarily concerned with physical oceanographic aspects, whereas over in, uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center, the OB DAC is the Ocean Biology DAC, and they're more concerned with ocean color and chlorophyll, things like that. Um, so on the one hand, we've distributed these data out to the various archive centers, and the rationale is that that allows them to hire personnel that are particularly uh, suited to support that data. Uh, so they'll hire support scientists. In fact, a lot of those scientists have a PhD and have done research uh, in the, the discipline where those products are, uh, that those products are related to. Um, but on the other hand, uh, there's the potential that we may have made that data a little bit harder to find now that we've scattered it to the four winds. And so to mitigate that, we, uh, EOS just provides a number of uh, common services which both helps to reduce the overall costs of EOSDIS, but also makes it possible for users to come to a single place to find the data in EOSDIS. Uh, so here you can see I've got the, the 12 DACs up there. Data providers, those are mostly those science investigator-led processing systems. A few of the DACs uh, have a DAC unique search tool that's particularly useful for users in that discipline. So for instance, it, it probably won't surprise you to learn that the National Snow and Ice Data Center and the Alaska Satellite Facility have a lot of tools that deal more with polar projections where a lot of the other uh, uh, DACs don't really, they're really hew to the, the simpler projections like uh, Mercator and Equirectangular. Uh, now some of the common services we provide, there's a, a global imagery browse service, which in turn is uh, used by a, uh, a high performance tiled imagery system called Worldview. Uh, there's a common metadata repository, which in a way is sort of the crown jewel of that EOSDIS common services, in that all of the DACs publish their metadata both at a data collection level and at an individual data file level. And this allows us to put a complete uh, data selection and ordering system uh, that can see the data at all of the DACs. Uh, there's an Earth Data login, which handles uh, user registration. We have a metric system, uh, which it's undergone a few changes in the past, but it's been fairly robust since the year 2000. And I'm going to show you some of the big data trends uh, that we can see uh, looking through that uh, metric system. And then finally, there's an Earth Data Search client, uh, which is a client to that common metadata repository. And this is the user interface that allows you to uh, basically see all of the data within EOSDIS. Now, I mentioned I was going to talk primarily about evolution, though, uh, and this, I've kind of I split EOS this evolution into three main eras. Uh, it actually started off with a system that was actually called the version zero system, which was meant to be an operational prototype. It's the kind of oxymoron that you know, gave the, the system engineers fits, because on the one hand, we're expected to push the bleeding edge uh, and do something that had never been done before, but on the other hand, we, we were also supposed to be operational to the user community. Uh, and in that, in that phase, which pretty much went up to 1998, 1999, uh, the two tall poles we had were one, just to be able to store that data, uh, but secondly, to be able to discover that data. And that was when we first developed uh, an information management system and a data search and order client that could see data across the entire DAX. Uh, that was called the V0 Information Management System. Uh, actually won a government award back in uh, 1994, which gives you an idea of how old that was. Actually almost pre-web. Uh, around 1999, the Earth Observing System satellites began to launch, and these represented a huge increase in, um, uh, in data volumes. Um, on the other hand, we were getting uh, really good uh, improvements in technology, which meant that the storage you know, for the first two or three years was problematic in that we had to put the data on uh, some very large tape silo systems. And as soon as you put the data onto the tape silo systems, you go from being able to do really synchronous data access to an asynchronous mode. We have to put in an order, we have to stage it for you, we send you an email. You know, if anything breaks down in that, we've got an order tracking system that will track that down. It's much more complicated than if we can just put the data out on spinning disk and have you come get it. Um, so in that sort of, uh, that sort of bronze age, uh, the earth observing system age, uh, our biggest problem actually became reprocessing. 
first to be able to get the raw data off of the silos in order to reprocess, but also because uh, we really did not have the computing power to reprocess as fast as we would like. We were sized to do what they call 2x reprocessing, which means it'll take you, um, it'll take you a year and a half to reprocess three years of data. Um, now, about that time, though, in that, uh, that middle age, the Earth-observing system age, we also had a similar distribution problem related to that, uh, the storage of the data on tape silos. About 2004, 2005, we were finally able to put most of the data on spinning disk. And one of the tiny little uh, incremental innovations that enabled this was the uh, development of a small utility for our... Um, standard data format, which is hierarchical data format, which allowed you to apply internal compression to the data uh, so that we could store it in an internally compressed form. And it's stored such that you can, you can individually compress chunks, which means in order to actually work with the data or uh, subset the data, you, did no, you no longer had to uncompress the entire data file. Uh, and it really was a sea change in our ability to get the data, all of that data, on the, onto disk. Um, so, past several years, up until the big data era, uh, you, we've kind of had solved the, both the problems of the reprocessing because of Moore's law had begun to solve that for us, as well as that distribution problem. Um, and so now we're beginning to come into the big data era, uh, and you can see that little triangle, you are here. Um, and here, what we think the tall poles are going to be are going to go back to that discovery process. Uh, and I'll show you why in a little bit. It's, a, it's a, one of the other Vs of big data. But more importantly, uh, the ability to analyze this much data. Uh, and particularly as our user community grows in addition to the amount of data growing. So there's a kind of a compound effect going there. Um, for this one, we think the game changer is probably going to be uh, cloud computing. And I'll talk about where we're going with cloud computing uh, to, to make that happen. So this uh, was taken out of our metric system. Unfortunately, it doesn't go all the way back to 1994 as I'd like, but I was able to get uh, metrics back to 2000. Uh, and you can see the rise over time. Uh, occasionally, you'll see a dip when we uh, deprecate a major set of data collections when we, as we reprocess them. Uh, but basically, it's, it's a fairly significant trend. And even since the year, I think it's 2000, yeah, since the year 2001, we basically have had a tenfold increase in the archive volume. We're going to have a new set of satellites going up in the, in the next few years, which are going to increase that volume uh, further. Now, if you put that across the distribution volume, that has also been growing significantly. Uh, until recently, it had always been a little bit uh, either greatly less or a little bit less. And there, you, I think you can see sort of, sort of the issue or the, the place at which that inflection point jumps up in that 2008, 2010. And this is, again, was the ability to have all that data on disk, uh, which also allowed us to grow our user community as well. Uh, and then finally, this past year, the distribution has crossed over with the archive, meaning we're now distributing more data than, than we're archiving. Um, along with this has come a significant growth in the number of users. Now, unfortunately, because the data have been available through anonymous FTP for so long, I can't really say exactly how many users. So we use the distribution uh, IPs as a kind of a proxy for that. So you have to take some of this with a grain of salt. Um, but there you can see uh, basically a tenfold increase in the number of IPs we're distributing to just since the year 2008. Uh, there's been a lot of increase in uh, traffic, particularly to uh, some of the Asian countries like China and Japan. Um, and then the, the last chart I'm going to show on, the, on big data growth is this variety problem. Now, it turns out that not only has the data volume been growing, but the varieties of different data, uh, different data sets, data collections have also been growing. This is a function of uh, basically the scientists producing more algorithms to draw geophysical variables out of those algorithms. But this is one of the things that makes the discovery problem uh, a little bit more, well, actually a lot more difficult on the end user standpoint, is you now have to go through, you know, th and this is just the data, data sets uh, distributed. There's actually a total of more like 6,300 data sets. And weeding through those to find exactly the right data sets for your particular science project are problematic. So in the big data epoch, where I see us going is to enable more analysis, 
closer to the data. Uh, and we're undergoing a review right now, which, which normally is you know, one of those things you just have to go through every seven years or so. It's like the locust coming out. Um, but it's really helpful for me, and particularly because I get to step back and look at you know, where are our coming problems and what are we going to need to do to solve that. Um, and so I, I made this statement to one of our headquarters scientists. I said, you know, we're going to enable more analysis closer to the data. And she said, well, I don't understand what that means. Um, and I thought I knew exactly what it meant. But when I broke it down, um, I realized I didn't really understand all the implications for that. So what I'm going to do is show you uh, how this breaks down into a number of different problems and solutions. Uh, the first is just looking at that statement, more analysis. Analysis to uh, actually to an archive has a lot of different meanings. We actually take it all the way back to simple subsetting because subsetting itself is a continuum that starts with the very simple uh, act of pulling a data variable out of a data file to the more complicated aspect of subsetting a spatial area, and particularly when you're dealing with these satellite swaths, which are not in a nicely you know, rectilinear grid. Um, and then uh, even further than that is quality filtering the data. Uh, and here I'm showing an example of a mask that uh, would be applied to AIRS level two data because we don't throw out any data. We keep it all, but then we'll mark it with quality flags as to whether you should be using it or not. Uh, you go ne the, the next step up, uh, the archives provide a number of services that do reprojection uh, or mosaicing. These are somewhat tricky, particularly because you have to worry about the information that you're losing in that reprojection or the mosaicing and figuring out whether that's going to affect your particular science problem. Um, and then thirdly, this, sort of, this set of analysis characteristics, even that uh, goes from a continuum of, of very simple statistics. Here, this is an example of a histogram. More complex statistics, where you're looking at seasonal time series. But finally, ultimately, what we would eventually like to get to is where the user can bring whatever their algorithm is. Here, just an example, I'm showing a, a Spark console window. Uh, it doesn't need to be Spark. There are a number of different ways that we might make that, uh, that, we might make that happen. But that ultimately gives us the ultimate uh, complexity as well as the ultimate capability that we would like to enable. Not that we'll be doing this. We want to enable the end users to be able to do this with our data. Now, closer to can also have a number of different meanings. Um, it can mean at the archive. And at the archive, we currently have a couple of technologies. One is the Grads data server. It's, uh, it's an open, actually, I think it's a freeware server that allows you to do a, uh, some basic gridded analysis at the server side. Um, ArcGIS also has a number of very powerful functions that you can apply, which also uh, often sits at the server side. Uh, and works directly on the data from disk. Um, now, there's a, a similar is you can have a near archive uh, uh, relationship. And in this case, uh, you, you, we're pulling the data over a high capacity LAN, which gives us the ability to pull fairly large co uh, quantities across there. Um, and then making that available through, in one case, a map server, which will visualize the data as uh, fairly simple maps. But we also have some more sophisticated tools, one of which is called Giovanni, which allows the user to do fairly, uh, some lightweight analysis in addition to visualization. It's really more for data explorations. But even so, uh, 700 articles, roughly, have been written using Giovanni as uh, an analysis or an analysis adjunct tool. Um, and then thirdly, we now are seeing this ability to put data in the cloud. Um, and this is kind of a quantum change, because if you're going to go to the uh, effort of moving the data a long distance, you also want to step back and ask yourself, is the data in the form that I have it the best way to provide that? And when we're talking about cloud, there might be some, or in fact, we know there are some advantages to completely rearranging the data to make it more usable through some of the cloud analytics platforms. Uh, and a couple of examples where they've already started doing this is the Google Earth Engine uh, and the NASA Earth Exchange. Um, and then lastly, what we're talking about when we say the data, even that can have several different meanings. Um, and this actually has to do with the form that those processing technologies I showed in these previous slides, what they're looking for. Um, 
the grads data server and the ArcIMS server, remember we're running those right on top of the data. They're gonna have to deal with the data as they are on that server. Uh, and so we usually talk about you know, just giving them the, the uh, original data as uh, distributed to us from that science investigator. Um, on the other hand, uh, we are now moving up to several cases where we're kind of grooming the data, which is to say that we're reformatting and annotating it. The data are in theory in a self-describing uh, standard data format, HDF, but in practice it turns out that there are so many ways of making little uh, deviations to what the uh, software is expecting that the software grows unbearably complex. And so what we do is we, we have a, a several cases where we kind of smooth off those uh, rough edges so that all the data look more and more alike. Uh, and we're not the only ones that do this. I know that the Earth System Grid Federation are, is, is also doing a very similar thing with their uh, Seymour data formats. And then as I mentioned, you know, if we're gonna really make a second copy of the data uh, at some remote location, we might as well think about whether it makes sense to reorganize the data. I mentioned Google Earth Engine, uh, SciDB is another technology that does this. I haven't shown all the technologies, Rastaman is another one uh, that does this, MapReduce, all of these allow you to do some very interesting things with, uh, with the data using completely different algorithms than the scientists are used to using. Um, and so this is my last slide. Uh, this is where we're going next. Uh, I haven't put any detailed prototypes up here because we're right now in the final stages of deciding what our, our next suite of cloud prototypes is gonna be. Uh, basically, one thing we, we are doing a lot of is collecting more science use cases uh, because you saw that the, the wide variety of, of problems and solutions that I showed earlier means that it can really be uh, a matter of which science use case you're trying to solve. Uh, so the more of those we can get on our radar, the better. Uh, we'll be building out some of those existing analysis support capabilities. Uh, that Giovanni system that I mentioned used to work only at one data center's uh, data, and we're building that out to work at five or six more of the data centers. And in fact, the, the code has actually been open sourced uh, so that uh, in the future, anybody will be able to get it. Uh, and then lastly, we're right now planning for the next uh, one to three years a set of cloud prototypes, both looking at uh, how we can use cloud storage to reduce some of the cost of archive, but what is the impact of that cloud storage solution going to have on a lot of these analysis things that we want to do. Uh, likewise, we're looking at some cloud analysis prototypes, both from the standpoint of that data reorganization uh, aspect that I talked about, uh, but also the possibility of provisioning uh, VMs with uh, science analyst analysis toolkits already installed on them. So sort of think of it as a extending platform as a service to be a science data analysis platform as a service. Uh, with that, I think I'll end and take any questions. Thank you. Craig Tierney, um, your plot of data growth usage, how do you plan to deal with the exponential growth and is the growth coming from specific data sets or is it coming in general from across all the data sets supported? Um, <clears throat> you know, I haven't done that analysis yet. It's a, it'd be a very interesting analysis to do. My suspicion is that a lot of it comes from the, the increase in the uh, data user population. Um, and as, as more and more different kinds of uses are envisioned for the Earth, Earth observing uh, system data, we get more and more users. And I think that's where a lot of that uh, distribution is coming. Well, having said that, I mean, the, the archive volume is also going up. And so, you know, product per product or, you know, data content per data content, that's going up as well as resolutions increase, spatial resolutions and temporal resolutions. So it's really a compound effect, and I, I don't really know, you know, which one is driving which. They're probably both on, you know, similar orders. Yeah, thanks for your talk. Um, two related questions. First, are you using a public cloud or a NASA private cloud? And when you mentioned provisioning virtual machines, um, are those to use on your cloud or to go, so to speak? 
Yeah, and actually I, I used in, in exact language on the virtual machines because um, it looks like some of that might come down to provisioning containers. Um, in terms of the, the public versus private, we've done prototypes on both. Uh, we had a couple of prototypes on the, the uh, Nebula cloud when that was started up. Um, and lately we've been doing some prototypes on Amazon. Uh, we do know that uh, there are other prototypes that we're also very happy to take advantage of as well. So uh, we do know, for instance, that Google Earth uh, Engine has been ingesting a number of EOS to data sets. And so we're tracking those prototypes to see how those uh, move as well. Your chart for IP um, accesses took off in 2008. What happened that year? Uh, that's another interesting analysis result that would would be that that I would like to look at. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know that we did start to see a lot of foreign distribution at my data center, which is where I was working at the time. Uh, so it, you know, some of it may have to do with. Uh, you know, the improvement of uh, Asia, North America network links, a lot of the, almost, in fact, I should mention that we used to do media distribution, we no longer do media distribution. Everything is uh, completely, well, it's almost true. Almost everything is, is done uh, via the network. Um, I think you also saw a number of satellites uh, begin to have their uh, algorithms reach a certain level of maturity which made it easier for more scientists to use that data. Uh, that common metadata repository is our main tool for managing it. So each of the DACs uh, publishes metadata on a regular basis. You know, often it's on a daily basis, can be more frequently. Uh, and that goes into a couple of uh, databases. I think we've got a Postgres and uh, uh, gosh, um, Postgres and another another database. His, his name escapes me for some of the document, uh, uh, the, the, data, the data collection uh, management. But it's basically all done in that common metadata repository, which is where you know we've got 6,300 data collections and I don't know tens of millions of data granules. I think. What is the size of your metadata? You know? I'm sorry, the size of the. No, I don't know because it's so small relative to the size of our data, we, we kind of usually don't worry about it. Hi, yeah. One question that's um, both for you, Chris, and a bit related to Earl's thing around economic impact of this. Do you have any sort of sense at all of the kind of economic value you could put? I mean, this, you know, apart from the science use of it in kind of an abstract sense, you know, there's clearly, you know, enormous economic potential it, for this. It is enormous and uh, notoriously difficult to measure. Um, there was a very interesting uh, study done, I think it was maybe in the early 2000s, um, uh, might have been done in Britain where they looked at measuring the ROI of data systems for several, one of which was the, one of the major British systems at the time, I think it was BADC, and found you know, really large um, return on investment from that from that data. Now I will say the data are expensive to get because you are, you know, launching satellites, but having said that, you know, with all those users, the economic impact must be significant. Now a lot of that economic impact also comes from folks further down in the value chain. So the guys that are, you know, driving their models with the data or assimilating the data into models, you know, they're adding a lot of that um, uh, of that value to that. 